Okay, so um, hi everyone, so I'm Antoine Le Don, and I'm going to be speaking about our paper which is about uh, disentangling the stable and curious audiences in web systems. Right, so we're interested in mathematically characterizing some time series such as the ones that we have on the screen which could, uh, for instance, uh, record the cumulative number of visits to certain websites or users of particular Twitter handles. So we can see already from these examples here that there are a lot of qualitatively different types of behaviors that we can observe and that we aim to characterize. Right? So for instance, some of them are pretty simple, right? like this one. We can see that there is actually a pretty uh, consistent amount of interest in the topic in this case. right? So this could be a topic which is mostly driven by uh, fans that regularly return to the website. right? In some other cases, however, we can see uh, quick sudden bursts of explosive activity, which could, for instance, be caused by viral trends or external events that cause sudden uh, extreme media exposure. Right. So, but what's really interested in interesting is that in some cases we can have a mix of both of these phenomena. Right. Like in the example that we have here, we've got a constant rate, then a burst of activity, and then back to a relatively uh, constant amount of interest. Right. So we'd like to really uh, characterize this in more details, especially in situations which are more complex than this one in the sense that we can have some interaction between the underlying processes. So to understand this a little bit better, let's look at these examples. So these are the uh, cumulative number of YouTube search queries in the United States for Michael Jackson and uh, Barack Obama, right? So the, uh, I guess the observation that really jumps out at you uh, first is the fact that there is a uh, massive burst of activity. There is a kink in the curve here um, at, at this point of time in the uh, Michael Jackson time series, and this actually corresponds to Michael Jackson's death, right? Second observation is that we can see that both before and after the, the kink in the curve, right, before and after Michael Jackson's death, we have a reasonable amount of consistent activity of people that come back to the website regularly, right? So there are a lot of uh, fans of Michael Jackson, right? So we're going to call this the so-called stable audience, right? But at the same time, we can see that at the skink in the graph, we also have a, an explosion of activity like the one that I described before. And this can be attributed to curious users. So that would be people that they might not be fans of Michael Jackson, but they perhaps uh, they, they want to see what's going on because of the uh, sudden media exposure that this caused. Right, so we have a similar phenomenon in the case of Barack Obama as well, right, with the transition occurring at the end of his second term in office. Right, so, but uh, really the next point uh, that we're particularly interested in, like I said, is the interaction between those two processes, right, because here we have those two highly traumatic events, right, the, uh, the Michael Jackson's death and at the end of Barack Obama's second term in office, and they didn't just cause this explosion of activity around uh, around the event itself, but they also permanently altered the level of interest that we have in the topic inside the uh, stable audience. So being able to model this mathematically is one of the key novelties of our model that we're going to talk about in a little bit more mathematical detail now, right? So how do we put all of this in a, on, on a firm uh, mathematical standpoint, right? So we've got the observed timestamps, so it's pretty much a sequence of uh, real numbers, right? So that's everything that we actually observe. Right. So we're going to make a uh, generative model that uh, sees these as being generated by three interacting processes. Right. So and you're already partially familiar with them because of the introduction that I've just given you. Right. So first of all, we've got a non-homogeneous Poisson process, which is going to model the stable audience of fans. Right. So this is something. This is a Poisson process with a an intensity function that's only going to change at a discrete set of unobserved transitions, which are these, uh, these bursts of activity there, right? So then uh, we're going to need uh, what we call a meta-poisson process, which generates the transitions, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit later about uh, how it's defined, right? Then finally, we have what's called a self-feeding process, which models the curious audience, like these bursts of activity, right? So a bit of background about the SFP process. This has been used before, but only on its own to model uh, explosions of activity in certain topics online, right? So uh, the activity function is defined like this. So you might notice that it, it depends on the past, right? So this is uh, the activity, uh, so, sorry, the intensity function at any point is basically a constant plus the reciprocal of the distance between the last two timestamps. So if you think about this, right, intuitively, it, it makes sense that this is going to encourage self-propagating behavior that we, that's going to result in uh, short bursts of activity and uh, long calm periods, right? Because if the last two timestamps were very close to each other, then it means that uh, this intensity function is going to be very high, so it's going to be very likely that the next timestamp occurs very quickly as well. 
Whereas conversely, if the last two timestamps are far from each other, it's going to be a while before the next one. Right? So we're still in, in the generation process here. Right? We'll talk about inference later. Then, uh, so I said that, so essentially, the uh, key component of the model here is that uh, the bursts are, occur at the same time as the transitions in the, uh, in the intensity of the stable audience. Right? So we want to model this. But of course, if you look at the sample parts of the uh, of the SFP process, you can't actually define very uh, formally where you're in a burst or where you're not in a burst, right? But we can take the intensity function of the SFP process as a proxy for where we stand exactly on this in a burst versus not in a burst spectrum, right? So this is what we do. And we set the intensity function of the meta Poisson process to be proportional to the intensity of the SFP process. So this introduces a complex dependence between the underlying processes. Of course, the meta Poisson process is not actually observed, right? So this, these are latent variables. Mm -hmm. Then the NHPP, the, the non homogeneous Poisson process, like I said before, constant intensity except during the transitions, right? So, and the generation of the transition is what gives us the dependency there, right? So, when it comes to inference, right, we have quite a few difficulties there in the sense that most of it, like I said, the only thing we observe is basically it's just the timestamps, right? So, we don't have any information about uh, which uh, visits came from curious users, which visits came from uh, stable users, right, fans of the topic. So we have uh, a lot of latent variables, which are the labels, as in uh, which timestamps come from uh, which audience. And at the same time, of course, we've got the transitions, which are also latent variables, right? So it's possible to write the likelihood function, but it depends on all of these uh, high dimensional latent variables, right? So uh, it sounds like it's a pretty good candidate for an application of the uh, expectation maximization algorithm, right? So this is what we're going to do, right? So if you remember, we've got uh, parameter mu in the SFP and we've got all these intensities for the um, for the stable audience. So these are the, the parameters here on the left and the latent variables are basically the transitions and uh, the labels as in uh, which kind of audience we're from. This is the likelihood function there and uh, so the issue, of course, is that it's not that easy to draw a sample from the conditional distribution, right? Because it's high dimensional and the likelihood is very high. It is, is a very complicated formula. But uh, so what, what we're going to, and um, yes, the, the normalization constant is intractable mostly, right? So this is a, a good candidate for application of a Gibbs sampler. So if you guys are familiar with this, a Gibbs sampling works by uh, splitting into components, right? And you fix all of the components except, some, except one of them. Then you update that one uh, conditioned on the rest. Then you switch to another one, you update that one condition on the rest, and you do this up to convergence. And this entire process is how you, you generate one sample. So we're going to do this here. But to do this, we need to um, introduce one additional random variable, uh, which is the number of transitions before TI. So it's a little bit redundant because uh, you already have the information in the, uh, in the transitions file, right? But it's, it's easier to separate the variables if we do this this way. And so this is the algorithm, right? We pick, uh, we initialize all the latent variables, then we pick a random timestamp ti uniformly at random, and then we update the mi and zi. So mi, number of transitions up to there, and the zi, whether or not it, be, it becomes to the stable audience, right? It belongs to the stable audience. And this is, of course, conditioned on all of the other m's and all the other z's, right? So this, this means that in particular, when you update the mi, right, this is conditioned on the understanding that mi minus one and mi plus one are fixed. So you know how many transitions before ti min uh, minus one and after ti plus one. So the only mystery is where those re uh, residual transitions are in between, right? So this, is, this makes the problem particularly simple and you will see that this is part of why we don't need to calculate the whole likelihood for any full path at any point in this process, right? The second uh, thing that allows us to do this here is the fact that the label actually only influences the likelihood through the SFP function up to the next two SFP events. And if you remember, this is, uh, of, yes, this is, this is based on the formula for the um, SFP intensity, which is uh, one over the distance between the last two SFP events, right? So basically, we, only, uh, we can only influence into the future up to the next two SFP events. So if we take both of the conclusions that we had so far and put them together, that means that when we calculate the conditional distribution that's required to update each of the uh, components uh, around the TI, we only need to compute the likelihood between the last observed timestamp, regardless of uh, its, uh, what it was, and the next two SFP events, right? So it's a small part of time. So this would not have been possible if we were uh, using other processes, like for instance, Hawks processes with a long-term dependency, right? So that would make the uh, complexity higher. 
So the, the M step uh, is uh, reasonably straightforward, right? You've got intuitive formulae that we derive in the paper. It's basically like uh, doing inference on standard Poisson process. And uh, so if we run this on real data, right, we obtain a pretty uh, good goodness of fit, uh, better than most other methods in many cases. And um, this is what it does in practice, right? What we're really interested in is actually, it's not making predictions, right? It's the interpretable information that we get out of, uh, out of running an E-step after convergence, right? Because then if we draw a sample from this distribution at the end, then we can have a reasonable guess of uh, which, uh, which timestamps came from the curious user, uh, users and which timestamps came from the uh, stable users and where the bursts of activity occurred, where the transitions occurred. So here you can see, for instance, that it reckons that uh, in the case of Eclair, there was just a burst of activity and nothing else. Whereas, for instance, for Bridget Medley, you have two bursts, one of which caused a change in the, uh, in the background uh, in a stable audience. So yeah, that's a summary, right? So we can disentangle the stable audience from the curious audience, detect bursts of activity, and detect changes in the underlying stable audience activity with this EM algorithm and Gibbs sampling. So that's it for me today, and these are <laughs> our affiliations. Thank you.